years. Now, to the business for today. Uh, I'm going to introduce to you Laura Nastasi, who is on the board for the Democratic Club, and she is going to be introducing Terry Goddard. Hi, I'm Laura Nastasi. I'm the Vice President of Programs for the DCSRA. And on behalf of the DCSRA and um, Alliance for Action, I'm so excited to introduce our speaker today. Um, he was born here in Tucson, his roots firmly established uh, here in Arizona. He studied his undergraduate at Harvard and then did a stint in the U.S. Navy. He then um, came back to Arizona where he got his law degree with uh, the Sun Devils up north. And <laughs> we're not going to hold that we're against you, right? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, he, what has he not done? He has been the mayor of Phoenix. He was the director of HUD for Arizona. He's on the Central Arizona Water Conservation District. Um, through his whole career, what this man has done is hold up the, the values of um, fair and clean elections. He's been a clean elections candidate ever since clean elections were established in Arizona. And he's fighting for us right now to keep our um, elections open and honest. So. With that being said, please give me, or help me, give him a warm welcome. Terry Goddard. My goodness. Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to be back in, in Green Valley. I was just going through the photos on my, my phone. I, I guess that's what we do these days. Um, and uh, was recalling... Uh, Four years ago, I was here for a, 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 a major uh, uh, function for the Democrats where Morris Farr and I were wrestling a, uh, a very large uh, paper mache donkey out of the back of a pickup truck. <laughs> and I, I'm happy to report that the donkey actually made it without being broken. Um, the election wasn't so hot, but we had a lot of fun in Green Valley. Um, thank you very much for, for being here, for having the chance to uh, talk to you a little about uh, a huge problem that faces all of us, uh, all of us who care about our government, our democracy, and the balloons that are <laughs> currently flowing over here. Um, but, but first, I, I've got a little report to give you because I think it's that unique. Uh, has anybody heard about Unrig the System? Yes. One of you, a couple of you have. It, it, this is a uh, conference, most unlikely place, most unlikely time. It was held this last weekend in New Orleans, which as you probably know, this is Super Bowl weekend on the verge of Mardi Gras. This is not the time, unless you're planning to have you know, heavy imbibing and partying, to be in New Orleans. And they brought 1,500 of the most intense political activists of all stripes that I've ever experienced together. There are two things about the conference that I thought were particularly interesting. Um, it was grassroots organizations from all across America. And the spontaneous spark that brought them together was incendiary, frankly. It was, we want to be part of a change. We think the system is not working for us, for anybody. And Unrig the System, obviously, was the name under which they came together. Uh, this was a conference that had maybe three or four hundred people signed up a month ago. And last Sunday they had 1,500 people that came into New Orleans for the discussions. And they were discussions. This was not somebody laying down a program. It was a lot of conscientious folks trying to say across party lines, what can we do about the American democracy? Because it doesn't seem to be working for most citizens. And they came up with three transcendent. There were lots of discussions and lots of various uh, reports, I'm sure, that will come out of this, and an awful lot of very important connections that were made. Uh, but the three recommendations I want to share with you, because I think they say a lot, both about the conference and about where we go next, about what can be done to repair some of the damage. Because I don't think there's any question. Every poll shows it. Uh, Americans don't believe that this constitutional democracy is really representing them anymore. 
And so the first one was money, and that's what I've come here to talk to you about today. I was, I was pleased to see that they agreed with me um, that unless you fix the way elections are funded, we're going to have serious trouble making anything else work right. Uh, the second is something Arizona, frankly, has taken a lead on, and that is redistricting. But many of the, 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 the citizen active programs across the country, Michigan now is perhaps the most important one that's happening, um, are focused on what we already have, which is a nonpartisan, uh, hopefully more or less academic, way to redistrict our legislative and our congressional seats. So that's one we actually, I think, are on the plus column, but most of the country is not. And the third is voter suppression. Uh, and unfortunately, our state has been one of the leaders in figuring out new ways to keep people who are otherwise eligible from voting. Uh, and that is a problem across the country. And it's something that I think in order to restore faith in the democracy, uh, we have to do a lot better job of making sure that people who are eligible to vote get to vote and are not scared away. So let's go back to money. Uh, money in politics uh, revolves around one decision I'm sure you know what it is. Uh, Citizens United in 2010 basically changed the rules. And it said, uh, and I don't say that, I don't repeat this because I agree with it. I repeat it because it's right now the law of our land that corporations are people and that money is speech. And therefore, the First Amendment gives them the right to say as much as they want, as loudly as they want, in whatever format they want. Um, that was, I think, a very unfortunate development. Here in Arizona, uh, I was a candidate in 2010, and I saw the cost of running for statewide office go up by a factor of not one or two or three, but five times. Just the raw amount of money being spent for governor or secretary of state or attorney general is five times today, or frankly, almost as soon as Citizen United uh, it became the law, uh, than it was before. And, and for citizens who thought they might want to run for office or that they want to get involved on a higher level, that was extremely depressing news. It basically meant millionaires and billionaires become the political class going forward. And then the second ev evolution, and the main thing I'm here to talk to you about today, is what has been generally called dark money. Uh, has anybody read Jay Jacobs' book? I mean, sorry, Jay Jacobs' book. That's a, that's a different life. Jay Mayer's book on dark money. Got one scholar, couple. Uh, an amazing piece of work. I, I, rep I uh, recommend it highly. Uh, this is a reporter for the New Yorker who spent two or three years of her life basically looking at what's been happening in this country over the past 30 years, where some very wealthy people, led by the Kochs, but certainly not only the Kochs, have tried to change the institutions uh, of American philosophy, of education, and of government. And they've done an incredibly good job because they've been very strategic in their investments. And <coughs> frankly, they have changed uh, the way America uh, works and votes. And uh, I don't think in most cases for the better. But one of the ways they did it is dark money. And dark money in a simple definition means money in politics where you can't identify where it came from. It's anonymous. And that alone, I think, is, is a reason to be afraid, to be concerned, uh, because in any debate, one of the first things you need to know is who it is you're debating with and what their motivation are and how kind of credibility, if we're voters, we should give to the ads we see that, say at the bottom, and, and you've all seen the ads, I'm sure, <laughs> citizens for good things, uh, <laughs> citizens to protect everybody. Uh, they are names that mean nothing. They sound good, they are totally innocuous, and they give you no hint as to where the funds that supported that particular advertisement are coming from. I think that's done tremendous damage to our democracy. And let me tell you a couple of reasons why. I'm sure you can fill in some other reasons. Uh, one, and I talk to young people, they say, you know, I, I see an ad, I have no idea who's behind it. How can I believe it or not? Uh, why does my vote mean anything? Because I may be persuaded by something that's said by somebody that I totally disagree with. It's trying to manipulate. <clears throat> and as we unfortunately know, many of the younger generation has decided simply not to vote. The millennials are one of the most amazing generations I think ever to happen just for their, their tolerance and their involvement <coughs> in almost everything but government, but politics. They have not been active voters. 
The second thing is what, what dark money in particular has done <clears throat> is it has disassociated the responsible party, the one who earned the money, who basically started this ball rolling, whoever that might be, corporate or personal, <coughs> from the ad that's out and finally placed. And I think everyone has decried the fact that politics has gotten so nasty, that there's so many ads that are, frankly, borderline truth or maybe not true at all that nonetheless get aired. And I think one of the fundamental reasons for that in the last 10 years has been because so much of it is anonymous. What you'll have is somebody way in the shadows who frankly has some community credibility. And if they had to stand up and say, yeah, that's my ad, uh, I vouch for it, I think the ads would look very different. Yeah. But instead, because of this elaborate labyrinth of one company giving to another, giving to another, giving to another. A deliberate effort to disguise the original source. You have at the end of the game somebody who is simply a paid executive. They're not responsible. It wasn't their money. All they need to do is to win a campaign by whatever means they can find. And so they will do and say anything and have. They're the designated felon, as, I, as a lawyer, I like to say, you know, when you get to the end, there's the guy that's paid to hold the bag, right? Well, that's who's running these organizations here in Arizona. And the other thing that concerns me particularly as an Arizonan is we are well known across the country as a test market. This is a place where Pepsi Clear, for example, got test marketed and it failed. And so we never saw any clear Pepsi. Um, and there are lots of other examples, but political ideas also get tested here because it's relatively inexpensive. We have a very accurate cross-section of the national population here in terms of age, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of, uh, I can't pronounce that word, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of income. And, and so if you want to make, you want, you want to test an idea, this is a good place to do it. And that's exactly what the Koch brothers and others have been doing to our state. In 2014, there was a bigger impact by dark money, but, and, and just so there won't be any confusion, I now call dirty money because I don't think there's any question that it's polluting our democracy. There was a bigger infusion here than any place else in the country. Uh, every race statewide that dirty money played in, and they played big, won. So here we have a state that has state officials, all of whom are beholden to some degree to this anonymous force out there for their election. Mm -hmm. Governor Ducey in particular has been one of the major national accolades or major spokesperson in favor of the Kochs and in favor of undisclosed funding for political campaigns. And he makes no bones about it. In fact, he was last week at the Kochs National Consortium that they had in Florida where they bring together the bigger funders that are part of their circle. It takes, I think, a minimum of $500,000 to play. So these are pretty big fish. And then the candidates who want their favor. And one of their main, main speakers was our governor. Um, I don't take any particular pride in that. I hope you don't. Um, but nonetheless, that is where the, uh, the, the, the lines are drawn here in Arizona. And what's happening, and what I think we need to be very aware of, is that what do you do with the test market? I mean, you, you try to see if certain ideas will sell. I think they've proven that pretty well. In 2016, they came back and used massive amounts of dirty money to elect the legislative leadership. Those statewide officers were up. And now they're waiting for the reaction. Will the people of Arizona say this is wrong? We don't want to have somebody way beyond our borders tell us what to do, how to vote. Or are they just kind of let it roll? We're going to say, well, that's the way it is. It's a corrupt system, and it's staying corrupt, and there's nothing I can do about it. Now, there was one very important pushback that I know many of you were involved in. It was called Save Our Schools, SOS, which got so angry. I love the way this program started. Uh, three women waiting to testify against the bill as it went through the legislature to move large amounts of public funds from the public schools into vouchers for private schools. And they thought that was seriously wrong, and they met sort of waiting to testify against that bill. And when it finally passed, and it wasn't supposed to, frankly, the, the early tally was that it was gonna go down. Some arms were twisted and it passed and the governor signed it in a nanosecond. 
And all of a sudden, Betsy DeVos said, this is a great thing. And the Goldwater Foundation came out and said, this is the beginning of the privatization of public education in Arizona. This is a great milestone. And these people were so angry that they started a petition drive right then and there. And most people said, no way. A, they're amateurs. They've never done this before. Second, they've got to get approximately 120,000 signatures in just 90 days, because that's what a referendum means. And what did I do? Standing on the court. I'm standing on the court. Oh, good. <laughs> and it's debating with me. Maybe I don't even need it. It's a dark court. I, it's a very dark court. Yeah, look at it. Um, we're not going there. Maybe. Um, but it's a clean court. It's, it's okay. There you go. Okay, what they did is unprecedented. Uh, I've done a few petition work in my life, and, and, and to do all volunteer, which people said couldn't be done, uh, to do it in that short a time, to get 120,000 signatures, and to file them proudly, and they've just uh, survived a judicial challenge, paid for by the DeVos Network, uh, so that they will be on the ballot in, in November. Uh, there's only one thing that could stand in their way, and that is the legislature, who, by the way, passed this in the first place, has the power I hope they don't have the, the, the guts, right, thank you. Uh, but they have the power to simply reenact the same statute. And then the, the initiative, the, the referendum, excuse me, goes away. Uh, they have to start all over again. Now, I don't think they have the guts to do that. That would be just looking in the face of all of those citizen activists and telling them to go fly a kite, uh, or worse. Uh, but that's a possibility, so we have to be prepared and, and hopefully have the, a reaction ready if that happens. But. I've been working for some time, I started two years ago, uh, standing up and saying, we gotta do something about the dirty money. We've got to stand up and make sure that at least we know the sources of everything that's trying to influence our vote. I can't, I can't repeal Citizens United, none of us can. Only the Supreme Court can do that. But what we can do is to make sure that we know the names, the identities of all the people that are trying to to influence, where they come from, what their motivation is. I think that's critical to the discussion. And so two years ago, as you may remember, I had an initiative. We, I, I, I learned one enduring lesson from that, never trust a billionaire, because the, the purple that were supporting us and, and another initiative uh, disappeared after about a month. Turned out they really liked dark money uh, so that uh, they didn't want to fund a program against it. Uh, okay, you either have money or time in this game. Uh, so this time we started a lot earlier with, I think, a much stronger and more effective uh, proposition, a constitutional amendment uh, that, if enacted, would do something, I think, critically important. It would say that all Arizonans have the right to know the original source of all major contributions trying to influence an election in our state. In a nutshell, that's the whole proposition. That's what we're trying to do with this, uh, this initiative. Yes, ma'am. Is that on the ballot then? Not yet. No, we'll get there in just a second. Um, there, there's an important step in between, and that's what I need your help with. Uh, this is a petition. I think many of you have done petitions. Uh, this petition is to put the item that I just described on the ballot in November. Uh, there's just one obstacle to getting on the ballot, and it's 225,000 ballot signatures. And I wake up every morning and it terrifies me. Uh, that is a huge, uh, a huge obstacle. It's a huge operation. Uh, it's over twice what SOS was able to get, but we have more time. And so the bottom line is I'm here with a, a heartfelt and I hope a, a very serious appeal to everyone who agrees with me uh, to give me a hand, uh, to give us all a hand, frankly, uh, and to get the signatures. If everybody in this room took just one petition, and I'm not asking for signatures here. Uh, that, would, that would be too easy. Um, what I would very much like to have you consider is to take one of these, take it home, sign the first line, and then have friends and neighbors and, and folks you meet on the street uh, to, to fill out the rest of the petition. 15 lines. Uh, if a few thousand people did that here in Arizona, uh, we'd be well on the way to succeeding with an all-volunteer effort to get this job done. Yes, ma'am. And first about the petition, I'd like to remind everyone that when you print your name and then sign it, stay within the line. If you don't, that's an excuse to kick your uh, signature. This is right back to the, what you learned in kindergarten, right? <laughs> the other uh, and, uh, associated with that also 
is uh, make sure that you are using the name that is on your voter registration card. If you go by William and you put Will, they'll use that to kick it off. You, 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 that's how obsessive compulsive this has become. And this is a reminder, I think most people here know that, but just a reminder. The second comment that you were saying about the extreme women who started the Save Our Schools and they were kind of poo-pooed because they were amateurs. As usual, people <laughs> underestimate what three really pissed off women <laughs> Amen to that. Well, just in case that's not good enough an example, or and it is right here at home, and yes, they were, and yes, they did. Um, let me give you another example, because it gives me a lot of heart, both SOS, and, and, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'm very proud that the SOS people are helping us with this, for a very simple reason. They're saying, look, we're here, we're in this fight because we believe in public education. We believe that this is a state that has significantly shortchanged public education, and we're not going to survive as a free people if we simply turn our public structure into a privatized operation for the benefit of Betsy DeVos and one or two others. I mean, they know that unless we can change the way our elections are funded, that there will continue to be these kind of secret assaults on ed public education. The same is true of, of our environmental standards. And yes, sir, you had a question? Uh, somebody said, or I read somewhere, <coughs> that we're not supposed to sign the petition that we're circulating. No, uh, I like the uh, there, is a, there is an important part there. You, you can't notarize your own signature. That's the one thing that as a lawyer I can advise you to do uh, if you are a notary, but you certainly can sign your own petition. Okay. Uh, every candidate, hopefully for office, starts out by signing their own petition, uh, and that's perfectly legal here. And, and frankly, the reason I advised it is that gives a prototype for everybody who signs afterward. Mm -hmm. and, and so they can look, and, and it, there's a, something very intimidating about being the first signature on a blank petition. If, if somebody can break the ice, you, you've, you've really made it much easier for everybody else. So it, it also, hopefully you'll do it within the lines, having gotten the appropriate caution. Don't abbreviate, don't put uh, GV. Uh, right out Green Valley, please. Uh, get the county, make sure that it's, you're in the right county. Uh, so we should around here have a Santa Cruz petition and a, and a, uh, a Pima petition going. Uh, maybe Cochise as well. Uh, just to make sure that, and, and the reason for that is not legal. It's, it's that when the Secretary of State sends the petitions out for validation, they will send it to whatever county recorder has the most signatures on that petition. And it simply means that anybody from any other county isn't going to get counted. Oh my God. You're not disqualified in any other sense, but you're just not counted. I, the reason we go to all this effort, you know, whoever said citizen activism was easy. Uh, and in Arizona, our legislature has gone out of its way to make it, to make it as hard as possible. Mm -hmm. So for instance, these, these petitions have to be, when you're all done, your signatures, you sign on the back that you pass the petition, you observe people signing it, and then it has to be notarized. Well, that's a huge obstacle for just citizen activists to overcome. We're unique in that way. Not many cities, not many states require notarization. Arizona does, because frankly, our legislature doesn't like to have the citizens tell them what they should have passed in the first place. Uh, but let me tell you a little about Michigan. Any Michiganders here? Oh yeah, a few, quite a few. Michigan had a similar transcendent experience back in August. One person, and she was a, I would think she, if she was 30, I'd be surprised. She was a young person who simply put out a Facebook message saying, anybody want to do something about gerrymandering? And a little smiley face. And she got about 20 responses, and they sat down, I believe in her kitchen, I may be wrong about the room in the house, but they sat down in a very basic location and said, well, what are we going to do about it? And the first thought was despair. You know, this is a big state, and we've got a huge obligation, and we're none of us politicians. And then they divided up the tasks. They did a joint drafting. They did some research as to what had happened on reapportionment in other parts of the country. And they ended up with a petition that was filed on the, I believe they, let me, I think I've got this right. On the 18th of August, they got 425,000 signatures with only volunteers by Thanksgiving. An amazing accomplishment. Most people thought it could never be done. And about a bread and butter issue. I mean, they got people in Michigan really excited about the idea 
that they had been gerrymandered over the years and they could do it better if they set up a citizens commission. Now we already have one of those in Arizona, so perhaps we're ahead of the game on that particular point. But we're certainly not ahead of the game on dark, dirty money, excuse me. Um, we, we are the national leaders, I hope I've made clear. And our legislature keeps bending over backwards to make it even easier. There's a bill going through the, the legislature right now which basically says if you're a 501c4, and that's the major vehicle legally that is used to hide the contributors. Not only do you not have to disclose, it says you cannot. And no city can pass a rule that says you should within that city. Now, why are they doing that? Because the city of Tempe has just passed a comprehensive ordinance which would require the same kind of disclosure of the original source that this petition would require in the city of Tempe. It also has some limits on campaign contributions in the city of Tempe. This, this law, if passed and signed by the governor, would basically preempt any city or town in the yeah. state of Arizona from doing the same thing. Uh, frankly, that's insidious. That, that is taking the legislative power and reaching right into some of our backyards in ways that uh, should never be possible. But I'm here because we need your help. I'm here because the only way this will succeed is if everyone here and way beyond this room, but this is a really good start, uh, we'll take one of these and, and, and get it filled out and get it turned back. Uh, we've got uh, Tavon Smith in the back who's taken on, uh, yeah, stand up Tavon, please. She's taken on all of Southern Arizona. Just a small job. And she's here to help. I mean, she's here to find notaries if you need them. She's here to make sure that you have enough petitions if you should ever run out. And we're, my goal in life is to make sure that never happens. Uh, and also to explain any, any questions that folks have. Now, there's a website that I hope you'll go to. It's called outlawdirtymoney.com. Um, and it has a lot of the explanations of why this is important, the text of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the proposed constitutional amendment. Uh, and I have some here and some in the back. There's no shortage today here in Green Valley. So if you would uh, take advantage of that, I would, I would very much appreciate it. But I'd love to have a further discussion. Yes, ma'am. Well, I just would like to give a very local example yes, of what I believe it was. Can you use the mic? I can't hear you back. Um, I don't know if I can reach me over that far. Um, I, I just wanted to give an example of. of uh, a local example of what I believe it was five women who started A for A. Um, I, I tell people it was three. I'm not sure. <laughs> but it was just about a year ago. And it was it was a group of pretty pissed off women down here in Green Valley that started an alliance I'm for action. A theme here. Yeah, and, and I'm, uh, I'm the communications director, so I'm, I have a handle on, on how many people come to our website and look at our Facebook page. And we have over 600 people who are subscribing and looking, and we, uh, we've started to raise money. We, we became an official political action organization. Um, we have a, a, a group that is uh, presenting candidates and will be uh, making a recommendation to the, to the leadership committee uh, for endorsing uh, before the primaries, because we can do that. We're not, a, we're not a, uh, an official Democratic group, um, and uh, I'm going to give you my card and also D Devon, Devon. Devon my card, so that you can get information to us, so we can get it out to our members. Thank you. Thank you very much. That, that's hugely helpful. And, uh, I'd like to say a little bit more about the nonpartisan and are the transpartisan aspects. But yes, sir. Thank you. I, I, I don't want to challenge what you said, but I, I do think there's something else working here. And, and, and I want to emphasize that 
I'm a Democrat, and, and many of my friends are, but not all of them. And this is an effort necessarily to be transpartisan, to be involved with folks from every political background, be they independents, Republicans, Democrats, Greens, Blues, wh whatever color you happen to adopt. And that was certainly the theme of the Unrig the System uh, session that I just came from. But I think it's critically important here. The only class that is clearly opposed to what I'm proposing here is the current class of elected officials that are in charge. Uh, they don't like it. And you'll hear a lot from the governor and others about how this is a violation of your personal liberty. Now they leave out the fact that as citizens, when we give to a candidate more than $50, we have to fill out our name, our address, and, and who we work for or if we're retired. Um, so I don't really see that there's a personal liberty issue involved here, but that's what he's gonna tell you. And there'll be lots of money behind it. So the other class that is seriously going to oppose it are the, the Kochs and the other folks who love to be, to campaign in secret. And that's true of most of the corporate, uh, let me just say this, most of corporate America does not condone secret campaigning. Uh, over 80% over of the Fortune 200 companies have specific shareholder policies that say, we won't do it. But there is a small minority that continue to do it because if they campaign in secret, then their customers and their shareholders never know that they've tried to influence election one way or the other. So there won't be any of the repercussions that they frankly don't want to see. That's one of the big reasons why dirty money has become such a big deal so fast. Uh, otherwise, we would have not seen big changes uh, at that scale in our democracy. Yes, ma'am. Is there uh, a chance that what you're doing or what we will be doing here um, would, it, I know there's a process in the Constitution, I don't know whether it's an initiative or a referendum that can go up to, from the several states, but go up to the Supreme Court. Is that correct or am I totally wrong on that? No, you're, you're really talking, and there is a 28th Amendment uh, movement right now which deals with repealing Citizens United. In other words, that, that would be a constitutional amendment. Yeah, okay. The Supreme Court is immune from all of us. You know, they have, uh, uh, they have lifetime tenure and, and they have tremendous power. But let me address very quickly, because you're going to hear this, not just from Governor Ducey, that this is a violation of our First Amendment rights. And I want to emphasize, I'm something of a constitutional scholar. I've spent a lot of my time as your Attorney General. Uh, doing two things, one worrying about the Constitution, and second trying to prosecute money launderers. And this is money laundering, uh, for pure and simple, trying to hide the ball, the same thing the cartels are doing. Yeah. What they're doing is trying to hide illegal profits. What the Cokes and others are doing is just trying to make sure that the voters don't know who's behind those ads. So I think that is, is absolutely critical to this process. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, before I came here, I went to the Secretary of State's website because, you know, she, she's actually had, a, I think, a commercial on TV about... Transparency. Uh, transparency and how you, can, how you can go to her website and find out who donated to who. Um, you, go to her, you go to the website and it's, it's, there's nothing transparent about how you find that page or, or information about how to... I mean, you, you can't find it. It's literally not there. Uh, I, and I'm sure it's there. It's buried probably under one of the one of you know one of the categories. But um, if you can find out how to get there, and you know, let me know, or have Devon let okay, me know. Okay. The, the point is that the Secretary of State has made a big point about how she's going to put better software on her website, which will allow you to be able to find out more about contributors. And I'm not here to bash Michelle Reagan. Uh, she and I have had our different disagreements. We ran against each other a little while ago. Um, but I, I commend her for trying to do that. But there's one huge, huge obstacle, and that is the Arizona legislature exempted the 501c4s, the folks that put $15, $20 million into Arizona elections uh, every cycle, from having to report it all. So however transparent the process is right now on the website, it completely ignores the elephant in the room. It completely ignores the huge amount of money that is just flooding into our state from 501c4 sources. And that is no small feat. And she actually said, when somebody challenged her on that, 
She said, well, I'm for transparency, and, and uh, maybe I'm supportive of the, uh, the proposition. Well, I called right away and, and left a message <laughs> saying, if you want to sign up in favor, that would be fine with me. We have lots of Republican support, but not one elected official supporting this proposition. They suddenly either got dark money, dirty money, are afraid of what it might do to them, or aspire to get some in the future. I think those are the three major categories of public officials right now. Uh, other questions, comments? Yes, sir. So this uh, referendum to get it on the ballot, if it passes, and I see an ad on TV like when they blast and carry the foot voters, I've heard that $400 million <laughs> that the folks just said they're going to spread around. <laughs> I think I did. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll pay the damages. The dark money? The $400 million that the Koch brothers are taking from the billion dollar tax cut and going to lavish all over the United States. If they're behind an ad that shows up, is it going to say sponsored by the Koch brothers, or is it going to be some shell company? I mean, Americans Prosperity is the company they, they hide behind. Um, that, that's a great question, and, but it gets me down in the weeds, and I, I've tried to stay away from, <laughs> try to give you the, 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 the treetop version. Um, what this proposition would do is it says the person who spends the money in Arizona, that's the designated felon that I referred to earlier, that's the person that's hired to be running the campaign, not the person that originated the money. They have to report, if they spend $10,000 or more, and, and believe me, they almost always do, uh, then they have to report the original source of all the, can all the contributions that led up to that expenditure. So if they spend a million dollars, They've got to tell you where that million dollars came from. Not the most recent check, not the ones that have the funny names, but the individual or the corporation that actually earned the money. So that's where the Cokes would show up. That's where the, the person that put the, that started the stream of causation that ended up in an ad in Arizona. Now, it also has a provision that says the top three, well, there should be appropriate disclosure of the major contributors on the ad. Now that, unfortunately, that gets down into the size of the point type and the, the, the how, whether it's, whether it's a contrast in color. I don't want to go there. And so we set up in this proposition, if it's passed, it would empower the Citizens Clean Election Commission to essentially be the rule maker and the enforcer. So they have, they exist today, they've been around for about 15 years, I think they have great credibility. They're totally nonpartisan. Uh, they would be the folks that would have to figure out how to put a disclosure <coughs> on the ad. So it really told you who paid for it. So they would be the ones doing the deep dive. They would have to do the deep dive. They would have to do the investigation. And if they fail, and frankly, I think this is all about suspicion, so we need to be as cautious and as careful as possible. There's also a citizen right of action. So if you saw an ad and, and, and went to the Secretary of State's website and saw that the disclosure apparently didn't go far enough, you could file a civil lawsuit, and if you're successful, you would get your costs and your attorney's fees back. Uh, the money, if you, if you won, from the fine would go into a public account, but you at least wouldn't be out the cost of the litigation. So there is a citizen enforcement provision as a last resort. And I think that's really important. Yeah. I think people right now don't really want to have a particular elected official overseeing the elections. And, and in Arizona, we do. Uh, so that's why I thought the Citizen Clean Elections Commission was a very logical place to put that responsibility. Okay, I welcome Bruce Wheeler. Just uh, walked in. His name is on this uh, uh, candidate forum. Thank you. Kelly Pryor is here, too. I'm running for governor. Well, what we want is all the candidates to endorse this proposition, and I assume by being here you do, um, and, and to take our petitions along with yours as you're going door to door, because that's one of the ways that this is going to actually move forward. Uh, other questions? I know it can be complicated, but hopefully in thinking about it and in talking to folks, you can get back to the right to know. This is about the yes. right to know where the funds come from. And I started to talk about what I know is going to be an attack on this, and I hate to talk about the negatives, but let's do that. 
Uh, this is a very <laughs> far-reaching and, and intelligent group. Uh, I know you'll hear, because the Goldwater Institute has already said it, that this is a violation of your right to privacy. It isn't. There is nothing in Supreme Court jurisprudence that says you have a right to hide when you want to manipulate an election. <laughs> and you may be surprised at who the strongest proponents of saying that are. Number one, former Justice Antonin Scalia, oh, who has said, and I quote him frequently, it's the first time I've had the chance in my legal career to quote Justice Scalia in a favorable way. <laughs> but I really love what he said. He basically said, in a democracy, a certain amount of risk is inherent in the process of running for office. You stand up, you express your views, you take criticism in the public square. And he, as a justice, never wanted to be part of anything that would allow political debate to be conducted in secret. He said to do that does not resemble the home of the brave, which I think are just stirring words, very appropriate. The other one is Justice uh, Kennedy, who wrote Citizens United. And there's a paragraph in Citizens United that most people skip over, but I think it's really important because he says, look, we understand that there will be more corporate money coming into campaigns, but we believe the antidote to more money is full disclosure. And Citizens United actually said, as part of their briefs, that they thought that they were their rights to express themselves would be chilled if they had to fully disclose who it was that was behind uh, the contributions. And Justice Kennedy took that on. He said, yes, maybe there is a little chilling effect, but it is counterbalanced by the huge public interest that we have in knowing who is conducting the debate. And my hero in this whole thing has turned out to be a state senator from Montana, Montana, two years ago, as you may know, passed the only state in the country to pass new, tough disclosure regulations. Super liberal, hard blue Montana, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the reason they did it, I think should resonate in Arizona. The guy who led the fight in Montana was a senator from Colstrip, Montana, named Dwayne Ankeny. And Duane is in his mid-70s. He's posed for his legislative picture in a Stetson hat with a handlebar mustache and a really severe frown. <laughs> now, how many politicians? Bruce Weaver would never, never be frowning in an official <laughs> photograph, I can tell you. But Duane did. And his slogan for on the floor fight about fighting against dark money was, if somebody's going to shoot me in the gut, I want to know who done the shooting. <laughs> That's what this is all about. We're trying to find out who done the shoot. How do you look in a Stetson? <laughs> I, look, I look terrible in Stetson. My, my wife forbids me to wear them. So it's ball caps forever. Yes, ma'am. I know we're running short on time, but could you speak just briefly to Kathy Harris? No. <laughs> the question is, can I speak to Kathy Harris? And, and as you probably know, or maybe you don't, Kathy Harris runs a very powerful uh, 501c4 uh, advocacy group in Arizona that frankly is a sort of an extra part of our state government. Um, I, I, Kathy Harrod would only be subject to this if, if she and her organization actually purchased ads. In other words, this proposition doesn't, and, and, and frankly that was a decision we made. Let me just throw that out because uh, I hope we went in the right decision, right direction. Uh, there is a proposition right now in California which says we have a right to know the source of the original source of all funds used to influence an election or governance. Or governance means lobbying. Yeah. And and frankly, I've learned from, from fairly fairly tough experience that we need to be as precise and as focused as we can. I did not include our governance. I hope that's an opportunity. If this is successful, that somebody will pick it up. I'm probably not going to do it, but I support it. I think we need to have a similar proposition that does apply to funding for lobbying. Mm. But I want to be very clear, this is just about elections. And so if you've got a C4 out there that does a lot of lobbying, this proposition does not cover who spent money for them. Uh, it does, however, and I think this is because this is the entry, entry place, especially here in Arizona, for uh, a lot of, of corporate money. And one of the reasons that, that if you look at, at citizens throughout this state and throughout this country, 
there is a huge proponent, a huge majority in favor of, of tough environmental uh, protections. There is a huge supporter for public education. There is a huge number in favor of social welfare for the, the folks who are most disadvantaged. None of that is reflected by our state legislature. None of that is reflected mm -hmm. by our national congress. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because the contributor class doesn't support those things. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, in the back. Um, we mentioned uh, Kennedy and his work for full disclosure. And my question to you is, are, is the Supreme Court waiting, in a way, for a court case that uh, asserts that <clears throat> not full disclosure, uh, et cetera, et cetera? That's, a, that's another great question. I, I Maybe, maybe. I mean, Scalia obviously is no longer with us, uh, and, and I don't know where the justice, uh, stand, the new one, st stands on that. I, I know Justice Kennedy has expressed, and, and this was a singular revelation. He did a speech in and in a press conference in California about a year ago <coughs> where he said that in, in issuing the Citizens United opinion, he had not realized how anemic the disclosure rules in this country are. He thought that if you tried to participate in politics, your identity would be clearly disclosed. And he admitted that he was wrong about that. Now, he didn't say he wanted to go back and redo the opinion. You know, that was, that, as a lawyer, I wanted to immediately say, Your Honor, I, I, I appeal. Um, maybe there's going to be something else through the system. I'm not holding my breath. Frankly, I think it's up to us as citizens to take this one on. Uh, I, don't, I don't expect any sucker. The, the Supreme Court simply said, we can't be challenged. This proposition can't be challenged by saying you have a right to hide your political participation. The Supreme Court has been absolutely clear that you have no such right. And the, the most conservative members of this Supreme Court have been clear on that matter. And, and in polling across Arizona, let me just close with this. This is truly a nonpartisan issue. Mm -hmm. Democrats are slightly higher in their support of full disclosure mm -hmm. than Republicans. Independents are right in, the, in between. But the numbers are breathtaking. Democrats are over 90%. Wow. And Republicans, even after there were some, some messages that, that might cause them to reconsider, fell to right about 80%. The statewide average is 85. Now that was a poll two years ago, but I think those numbers have only gotten better. And those, that recently there was a sort of a phone-in poll at the Capitol Times, which showed 86% in favor of this specific proposition. So I'm, I'm not worried about it if we can get it on the ballot. I think citizens of this state, on a bipartisan basis, are ready to adopt it and embrace it. They are sick and tired of having somebody else who they don't know telling them how to vote. What, what's the due date on getting these in? Well, let me just say my plea is that you'll fill them out and send them back right away. <laughs> um, the final, final, final drop dead got to be in by is July the 5th. But if we wait until July the 1st to start gathering them back, we're never going to make it because this is, I, again, let me get back to that number, 225,000 valid signatures. Because of strict enforcement, we need 300,000 valid signatures because we know some of them will be thrown out for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, not because they're not valid, but because they didn't sign it precisely right. Uh, so that is a huge job. It means every day we've got to bring in thousands of signatures. And that's why I'm so intent upon hopefully everyone here taking at least one petition, more if you like. Um, and, and, and just seriously getting it filled out and bringing it back within, let's say, a month. Because then, that, then we'll know where we stand. Then we'll be able to make an accurate uh, assessment. And, and Tavon is going to do something that nobody's going to like. Um, there are numbers on the back of these petitions, and we want to know where they are. So if we can just get some way to contact you, a phone number, a quick name, and we don't have to have your legal name. Uh, <laughs> you can use your initials or your nickname. But we do want to know where the petitions are going. So that'll take a few minutes. I apologize for that, but it's really necessary. When they get mailed in, do they have to be mailed in flat, not folded? Well, it would be preferable. Um, and, and, and you say mailed in. What we're going to hopefully do is have some, some folks here in the Green Valley community who would be repositories both for blank petitions, if you need one, and where they could be turned back so that okay. everybody doesn't have to invest in, in mailing okay. them back to me. Okay. Uh, that would be too much. Okay. So we're trying to make this truly a grassroots statewide effort, and hopefully that will be the kind of basis for doing some other good things in the future. So the person that you return them to, will they, can they get the no organization? No. 
No, the notary, the notary has to see you sign it. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's, that's, I mean, this is an obstacle. Let's, let's be brutally frank. Um, it, it was intended to be an obstacle. And so it's one of those things we just have to overcome. And yes, there, way in the back. Is there a uh, notary in, in the office, DCSRA? No. D, no. no. But I will tell you, most banks, banks will yeah. give you free notary services yeah. and sort of bills. Well, and one of Devon's many jobs is to have a network of notaries throughout Southern Arizona. I just became, I've been, I've been a lawyer for 35 years. Last week I became a notary public. Um, so I'm, I'm there to help. If, if somebody needs a, a free notarization, we're, we're ready to do it. Yes, sir. Is this being publicized through the press and the, uh, the uh, print or uh, video media? We're trying as, as, as much as we can to get the word out. Anything you can help us with. I mean, I was in Flagstaff a couple of weeks ago uh, with the Indivisible group. And they immediately went to the Flagstaff Sun and got an op-ed column with one of their members saying they just heard about this, they were very supportive, and they wanted everybody to know about it. Uh, and, and so I, I also think social media is tremendously powerful. I, again, my message is we, you don't have to go get 100 signatures, but if a few thousand people would get just one filled petition, we're going to make it. I mean, that's the kind of thing we need to do. Okay, back to the corner. Did you, did you pay someone to do, uh, get petitions completed? Uh, a, a tough question. Um, we don't intend to. This is a volunteer effort, and, and frankly, with the shoestring budget we've got, it's going to stay a volunteer effort. Uh, somebody could swoop in with a few million dollars, and the legislature changed that one too. It used to be you could pay per signature, and there's a whole group of people, most of them are in California, uh, who make their living doing that. Uh, I don't happen to like it very much. I, I think it's not exactly the democratic way to get something done. Uh, but you could do it. They, they, they abolished that. The legislature abolished that. But somebody could be hired just for the purpose of uh, getting petition signatures. The only thing the law says is you can't specify precisely how many they have to get to get their salary. So yes, it's possible to have a paid petition drive in Arizona. It's a little more difficult than it used to be, and we don't intend to do it. You should just mention that all these pages have to be kept together. Oh, yes, yes, the staple. We have the sacred staple. <laughs> Don't separate the pages. They have to stay as they are because, and this is, this is actually a valid concern. If the Secretary of State sees that they've been restapled or that there's evidence that the staple was taken out, the immediate supposition is that something else was attached and then it got substituted. So those names will be, will be disqualified for that reason. Uh, I just ran into, uh, think about this for a minute, why this is important. Um, somebody was passing a recall petition, and this was here in Arizona, telling people that it was actually a, um, a clean air proposition. And people were signing, didn't read it, signed it with that proposition. And um, so, so it is important that the actual text stay together with the signatures. That's, that's, thank you for that detail. Sir? I would think we could drop them off at the Democratic Club. Is that right, Dean? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the, the headquarters downstairs, which is for the Democratic Club, is right next to Carney Evino, the restaurant there between the barber shop and the restaurant. Um, the club is open 10 to 2, uh, Monday through Friday. It can be a repository for both picking up and checking out if you don't do it today or want more, and also returning, and they'll take good care of it. And, and, and we're recruiting what we call ambassadors. Uh, if anybody is willing to take on a little extra role and, and meet with Devon, um, and that would simply mean that you would have a supply in your house of, of additional blank petitions and, and could help people who have questions or need to get together with a notary uh, or need a place to turn it back. And, and we're online, we will have listed all of the folks that are, th these are lessons we learned from the SOS campaign because they used ambassadors throughout it. Is we are remarkably accurate cross section of the country in, in many ways, income, race, age, uh, so that if you test a product here and it's successful, then it has a pretty good chance to succeed in other places. If you test a political idea here, and it is either successful or rejected, you 
pretty clear that that's probably what's going to happen. We're like a massive focus group for the country. And that's why they're, they're, they're focused on us. And the big question that has yet to be resolved is what are Arizona citizens going to say about the fact that the dark money, the dirty money, excuse me, has, has basically elected all of our statewide officials except one. Yeah. Somebody might want to know who that was. Yeah. Yeah. Diane Douglas, the only one who didn't receive uh, 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 really? massive amounts of dark money. <laughs> I don't think anybody thought she'd win. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm not going there, but uh, we, we are clearly the test of those ideas. And if we don't stand up against it, as SOS already has, you know, they were the first statement of citizen outrage. We're not going to take it anymore. And this is the second act for that, that outrage. Okay. Yes, sir. One last. Is, is there a copy available? I'm not a I'm president of Arizona, but I'm very interested in this entire project that you've taken on in our state. And I'm wondering, you talked about this, there being numbered. Are these petitions numbered and so forth? Or they are numbered. You, it's, it's, we added an extra page because we can't touch the pages of text. I have a copy right here if you'd like it. It's also online at outlawdirtymoney.com. But let me just give you this copy. Um, I, I hesitate to give you a petition because no. we, we, they're sacred. They're, 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 they're very valuable. <laughs> um, we don't have any to waste. But what state are you from? Illinois. Illinois. Okay. Um, you, you can use some help. I, yes. I, I, I hesitated to answer that. <laughs> well, actually, look to the north. Look to the north, the, the, and, and this is something you could also uh, search on the web. The, uh, the name of the organization that passed the petition in Michigan and, and, and is, is Voters Not Politicians. And you will find that there, and they really were. Uh, voters, not politicians. They were people that, that sat around the kitchen table and came up with this initiative and then just made it happen. And there were 4,000, I didn't go through the numbers. The numbers are impressive. They have five numbers that they, they sent you to with a little smugness, frankly, they, and they're entitled to be smug. The first one is 425,000 signatures. <laughs> the second one is 4,000 plus volunteers. The third one is, let me see, I'm getting this mixed up. Um, I know what the last two are. What was the? Uh, uh, okay, I thought I had it. I thought I had it. Uh, oh, it was. Uh, oh, 100, 183, which is the number of counties in Michigan. Amazing number. I mean, we only have 15 in Arizona. It seems a lot easier. Uh, the, the next one was two. They filed two months before the deadline. Wow. Oh my gosh. And the last number was zero. Zero paid petition. Wow. And, and I look to Michigan with real respect because those citizens just made it happen and, and knocked everybody's socks off. Yeah. So I thank you all very much. I think we have a fantastic <laughs>